Good morning. All right. We are about to get worship started, and so we are going to ask for everyone that is uh, in the building and not yet in the sanctuary, that to include one Darren Myers who I can see out in the foyer. We're going to ask for everyone to uh, go ahead and make their way into the sanctuary and take a seat. Because like I said, we're about to get the service started. We are uh, so appreciative of everyone that's here along with everyone that's watching virtually. We do not take your presence for granted. We want you to know how much it means to us that you would choose to spend your Sunday morning here with us. And we ask that while you do so, along with us, you make a prayerful, concerted effort to focus on God and His glory as we worship Him. And that's what I'm going to pray for in just a moment. And as I do every Sunday towards the end of that prayer, I'm going to pause for a few moments of, uh, of silence. And during that silence, I'm going to ask that everybody that's tuning in would, within their own heart, pray for our service, pray for our worship, that, uh, that we would worship in spirit and truth. So let's pray. Father God, you're holy and mighty and wonderful. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you so much for the context we live in where we can come and worship you without any fear of real persecution, God. Um, God, I pray that you would bless our service. In a moment when the worship team comes up here, God, I pray you would bless them. I pray you would move in their hearts, move in the hearts of all those in the congregation, all those that are watching virtually, that, uh, that we could truly worship you, God, that we wouldn't just be singing songs and making noise, but that we would be, uh, be actually offering a sacrifice of praise to you and actually bringing glory to you, God. We know that's the only thing that matters, and we know that we can't. We're incapable of that without you moving, and so we pray for that. Um, God, I pray for all those that are, uh, that are watching that may be hurting, all those that are watching that, uh, that are aware of the brokenness in their lives and in this world. God, I know that we all experience brokenness, and at times it can feel very overwhelming, and I pray that you would help us to look to you, God, we believe, help our unbelief, and help us, uh, help us put our trust on you and our focus on you, God, um, and help us run the race that's set before us. God, I pray for uh, our pastor and our worship pastor that you would bless them and comfort them throughout the service, that they would know they can lean entirely on you. And um, I'll have a moment of silence now. Thank you, God, as we, uh, as we celebrate the 4th of July this week. We are, uh, we're thankful for our country, God, but I uh, pray you would help us to be more thankful of our true citizenship in heaven and more thankful for the freedom that we have through your sacrifice of your son. And if there be anyone here watching that uh, has not come to know you, um, that you have not opened their heart, God, so that they would receive you, I pray that you would do so this morning, God, using, uh, using this service as an instrument so that when we continue to praise you a million years from now, God, they can be there with us. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise the Lord, family. How you doing this morning? Amen, amen. We are so glad to have this opportunity to gather together with the family of God uh, here at the Lighthouse. We thank God for each of you. Uh, it's always a blessing to stand and to see your faces uh, gathered together in one place to give glory and honor to our God and Father. Amen. The song says, in Christ alone, my hope is is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. We invite you to come and to, to declare that with us together in one voice. God praise in this place. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing? Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Good to see everybody. 
There he, there he is. What's up? What's up, Zach and Alden? I just, I'm sorry, I'm excited. Just wanted to give a shout out to them. Um, for, for those of you all who don't know me, I think everybody in the room knows me. My name is Brian, uh, service lead pastor here. The uh, reason I'm so excited that Zach and Alden are, are here because, is because they've moved. And, um, and, and I, thought, I thought I wasn't going to get a chance to say again good, uh, hello from this stage anytime soon. But it's great to see you guys uh, hanging out with us on this Sunday morning. Praise God, man. And uh, thanks, to, uh, th thanks to everyone else that's joined us uh, for worship here at City Light on this Sunday morning. I pray um, that the Lord blesses you this morning and refreshes you and encourages you in your walk with him and strengthens you in your walk with him. And so I'm praying for just uh, for this entire morning to be a morning re of refreshing. Uh, we know that this is indeed uh, the 4th of July weekend. So happy 4th uh, for those of you all who are uh, who who will be celebrating with friends and family on Tuesday. And I got some ribs in the freezer myself. And so uh, we'll be barbecuing at the Crawford House. And so just want to say happy 4th to all of you and pray that you have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, week as well of holiday, um, holiday friends and family and travel as well. Um, with that said, typically what we do is that every um, July and every December we take a break from, uh, from missional community gathering. And so we're going to be on break and on pause through the month of July. Um, again, that's an opportunity for folks just to rest and, and connect, um, but please don't let that be an opportunity or a reason for you to not connect with others, um, to not go out for lunches, dinners, to hang out. Uh, this, the family is still family, and so we want to encourage you to be family and seize the opportunity uh, to serve one another and, like I said, be connected to one another uh, while we spend time in, in rest and recovery during the month of July. And in the month of August, the very first Sunday in August, we're going to be back um, and having our Bless the Block celebration right outside uh, of these doors after, serve, after Sunday morning service. Um, we're collecting school supplies even as we speak right now, so please bring your pencils, your, your loose leaf paper, your folders, and your notebooks. We're collecting those, and we'll be stuffing book bags pretty soon with all of those items, and we want to encourage you um, to bring those in so that we can start stuffing backpacks and hopefully have a lot of backpacks to give uh, to the students around this community um, here around our, uh, around our four walls. Um, and so we pray uh, that the Lord will bless us uh, tremendously. We're looking for at least 50 backpacks um, that we can fill. Hopefully the Lord will bless us with even more. We'll be praying to that end. Um, we love nothing more than for every single kid in this neighborhood behind us and beyond to get backpacks for school to start out the school year on the right foot. Amen. Amen. So pray to that end. Help us in whatever way you can to that end as well. Um, and we appreciate you greatly for that. Also, we've been talking about DNA uh, restarting in August. DNA is discipleship, nurturing, and accountability. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. And so discipleship, nurturing, and accountability, simply put, it's groups that meet somewhere in the neighborhood of about three to four, three to five people. They come together routinely. Um, they share with one another the, their burdens and what's going on in life, how they can pray with one another. They challenge one another. They study together. Um, they just catch up on what's going on in life in general. We want to encourage you to be a part of that, all right? And so if you would like to be a part of that, do, do me a favor. Just write your name down. Say, hey, I want to be in a DNA, but I don't have one, and just drop it in one of the offering boxes as you're exiting this room, either on the left or on the right, those wooden boxes right next to the doors. You can drop, when you drop an offering, you can drop just a note to say, hey, I want to be in a DNA and just leave your name. We're trying to collect those names so we can figure out how to pair people up that don't have DNA uh, groups that, they, that they're a part of yet, but they would like to be a part of a DNA group. And so we want to go ahead and do that um, as early as possible. So please, by all means, drop your name in one of those boxes. Um, again, some of these groups, you know, the group will decide, but they can meet you know, once a month, they can meet once a week. Um, you know, it just depends on what the group decides and the rhythm that they establish that's comfortable for them. Uh, but we want to get these groups together and we want to start seeing people growing together in the Lord. And so that's what we're going to be driving towards. So we want to encourage you to please uh, be a part of a DNA group. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. It's great to see you guys. So, so blessed to have you and so blessed to worship with you. Would you please stand to your feet as we continue to worship the Lord Jesus? It's a very fun song. We've only done it once here. Uh, but I love, again, just the declaration. Uh, and it is saying to God, it is us saying to God through this song, God, you are everything. There is none like you. You're father to the fatherless, mother to the brother, uh, mother to the motherless. You're the friend that stick is close, that sticks closer than a brother. I still got King James in me from coming up. Zach. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, just that declaration, you know, so whatever it is that you're needing God to be on this morning, just sing it to him through this song. Amen. Amen.
Join us now as we read from God's word, Psalms 145, verses 1 through 14. Our dear sister Kita is going to be leading us this morning. Uh, if this is your first time here, it is not your first time here. We are still reading responsibly. She'll I will extol you, my God and King. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Or on the glorious splendor of your majesty and of your wondrous work, I will meditate. They shall pour forth the fame of your, my glasses, I don't have my glasses today, guys, of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. They shall speak of the, of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. All together. The Lord upholds all who are faint and rises up. Amen. Man, the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his holy word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, another beautiful declaration. You know, in, in, in times of trouble, Matt talked about the brokenness and hardship that we see and even that we experience and even, even in our own world. And sometimes it can feel like things are impossible, that things will never get better, that we're powerless to do anything about what's going on around us. But this song is a beautiful declaration and a beautiful reminder that our God is able. Even when we come to the end of our strength, our God never comes to the end of his. Amen. So let us lift our voices and sing it together.
that he's able. Amen. Amen. His arms are not short that he cannot save, but he saves to the utmost. We are grateful for him and for his mighty acts on today. Now, family, pray with us as we prepare our hearts to hear from God's word. Heavenly Father, we bow before you today and give you praise. We're here to sing and to speak and to think on and to enjoy your greatness. And that is what we're going to be doing for the rest of eternity. And that is where we can find complete joy in lifting you up. Our God, who is the only one who is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes, allowing us to see your glory and giving us hope and longing for the day when we get to be in heaven in your presence. Lord, we pray that you would give us spiritual wakefulness and alertness. We pray that our eyes would not be fixed on the things of this earth, but our purpose of serving you and extolling you would be at the forefront of our minds and our hearts. And Lord, we ask that, we ask that you would give us strength and energy to go on walking through this life, Lord, to have that alertness, because now is not our time to be asleep, to be slothful, to be weak. Lord, there's spiritual warfare going on around us, and we pray your help to fight and to be strong. Lord, we pray that, that Jesus would be in us and before us in all that we do. Lord, this morning we ask that your word would be faithfully preached, would be spiritually properly understood mm. and that subsequently it would be fully obeyed and Lord that we would love you all the more because of it may you be glorified in Jesus name Amen Amen please remain standing as we turn our Bibles to Jonah chapter 4 Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4 for our youngsters, 3 to 8. You can be dismissed with Miss Nicole, who's in the back. And you guys are going to have a great time together this morning. For the rest of us, let's turn our attention to Jonah chapter 4. Again, we are closing out our journey through Jonah this morning, picking up here in Jonah chapter 4, 
and we'll read the entirety of the chapter. These are God's words. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself there, and he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should, I, should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy and errant and infallible word. You may be seated. When's the last time you were really angry for the wrong reason? When's the last time you were really angry for the wrong reason? Maybe you were really mad because somebody said one thing to you, but you heard an entirely different thing. Maybe you were really angry because you were just having a really bad day and overreacted to something that was a lot simpler, a lot smaller than you made it out to be. I recently read about a person who was in a bookstore and got really upset with one of the workers, employees who was helping, offering to help him because they weren't offering better help for the customer in finding a particular book, a particular Bible in fact. The customer wanted and searched high and low through the bookstore looking for the original version of the Bible. But when the worker showed them a Greek New Testament and a Hebrew Old Testament, the customer got really upset because they wanted the real original version, the English version. And after a bunch of back and forth, the worker just left the customer in the King James section, figuring that maybe that's what they were looking for in the first place. Sometimes we can be really angry for the wrong reasons. And as we wrap up our journey, thanks brother, as we wrap up our journey through Jonah, we close this book with Jonah getting really angry with God for all the wrong reasons. In fact, there's two particular reasons that Jonah gets really angry with God here. The first reason that Jonah gets really angry with God is because God preserves some people. And the second reason that Jonah gets really angry with God is because God kills his plant. And that's the chapter. He's really angry with God because God keeps some people. And he's also really angry with God because God kills his plant. And in these two reasons, God is teaching us something about Jonah, but he's also teaching us something about us. So let's look first at Jonah's anger towards God and towards the people that God decides to keep. Verse 1, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. It exceedingly displeased him. Those words are important. In other words, Jonah was overwhelmed with anger, overwhelmed with displeasure. According to some language scholars, in fact, the sentence can also be constructed, it was evil 
a great evil to Jonah. Jonah saw what was taking place as a great evil. That construction is kind of important because there's some interesting wordplay that takes place that starts back in chapter 3 when God first relents from the disaster and continues into chapter 4, verse 1. So the same Hebrew root is running through verse 10 and verse 1. Verse 10, verse 10 of chapter 3, it says, when God saw what they did, how they turned away or how they turned from their evil, that's a Hebrew root, their evil way, God relented of the disaster. That's another same Hebrew root, evil. So God relented of his terror when they turned from their terror, and he said that he would not do that to them, and he did not do it. So when Nineveh turned away from their evil, their bad, their terror, God relented on giving them the evil, the bad, the terrible consequences that he was storing up for them. And then Jonah saw it and saw his relenting of the disaster and thought in and of himself, that's evil. Nineveh repented, same word. I mean, Nineveh repented, repented of evil. God relented of the evil, the terror, the disaster. Jonah said, that's evil, what's, doing, what's going on right now? In other words, Jonah is saying there is another moral horror that was created on that day than Nineveh. And that was God refusing to execute what Jonah considered would be justice on Nineveh. You see, regardless of their holistic, heartfelt repentance that we talked about in chapter 3 last week, Jonah believed that Nineveh should, should have still fallen. Remember, Jonah was, Jonah's going around in chapter 3 saying, 40 days and Nineveh will fall. 40 days and Nineveh's going down. And Jonah wants Nineveh to go down, but God doesn't let Nineveh go down. Why? Because Nineveh repents. And God spares them. And this makes Jonah angry. In fact, the Hebrew word construction around verse 1 where it talks about this anger is actually a picture of burning with anger. So Jonah is flaming in anger. He is fuming with anger. Back in the day when I was coming up, we would have said that Jonah was not just hot, but 430 hot. You say, what in the world does 4.30 hot mean? It means that the day is almost done. In other words, I got nothing left. And so if there's somebody says one more thing to me, it's on. And so Jonah is that level of heated here, except it's completely misplaced and completely unrighteous. He says, this is what I was running from the entire time. I knew you were going to do this. I knew you would allow this to happen. And the anger is completely misplaced and completely unrighteous. You see, any time, any time your anger places you on the other side of God, your anger is misplaced and your anger is unrighteous. Any time you find yourself where the word is on this side, and you're on this side, your anger is not justified. No matter how much you want it to be justified, it's not justified. Now let's dig a little deeper into the source of Jonah's anger here. Look at verse 2. It says, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this, is this or is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. That's an incredible lie. The last time we saw Jonah praying, he was praying thanksgiving in chapter 2 from the belly of a fish and praying a vow to the Lord that anything the Lord needed doing, he would be grateful and thankful to do. He's going to sacrifice whatever he has to sacrifice, and he's going to pay his vows to the Lord. Why? Because salvation belongs to the Lord is what Jonah said. And now we're in chapter 4, and Jonah's praying again. But this time Jonah is praying a prayer that wasn't like the prayer in chapter 2. Now Jonah is praying to the Lord, hot with anger, and basically saying, I knew you would do this. I knew you would let them off the hook because I know you. Isn't that something? I know you. 
That's what he says in verse 2. He says, for I knew that you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast, steadfast love and relenting from disaster. If this description of God sounds familiar to us, it's because it is. All throughout the Old Testament, you hear this description over and over and over again of God. And the most prominent place you hear this description of God is in Exodus chapter 34, verse 5 and 6. Maybe you recall this story. God is on the mountain, or Moses is on the mountaintop with God. They're having conversation. And in the midst of that, Moses says, I want to see your glory. And God says, you can't see that. Otherwise, you'll die. But I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'll allow my back to pass by, right? And then he does. And when he does, this is what he says about himself. The Lord descends in the cloud. Exodus 34, 5 and 6, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Verse 6, it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is the moment where God shows his glory to Moses and speaks of his covenant nature with Israel. And Jonah knows this is exactly who God is. He's heard it over and over again as God describes his love and his patience and his kindness towards Israel. But it's as if in this moment Jonah is saying, I knew you were like that towards us. But I had hoped against hope that you weren't like that with these folks. I kind of figured you were, but I really hoped that you weren't. You see, I know you are gracious and shower me and my people with unmerited favor, but I was hoping you wouldn't shower this group with unmerited favor. I knew you were merciful and always met me and my people right where we were and gave us everything that we needed, even in our waywardness. But I was hoping that these people wouldn't receive that. I mean, God, I know that you are incredibly patient with me, and I know that you are incredibly patient with my people and slow to anger towards us, but I was hoping your wrath would move a little quicker when it came to these folks. I know you're unbelievably consistent in your love and your faithfulness towards me, and I know you're unbelievably consistent and faithful in your love towards my people. I know you're always there with your arms open wide for our return, but why would you do that for them? You see, Jonah knows God, and that seems to be the problem. He knows God, and he knows God's character is not consistent with who Jonah wants him to be. God isn't who Jonah wants him to be in this moment. He's not reflecting Jonah's image of vengeance, mercilessness. Family, how often do you want God to reflect your image when it comes to those outside of your camp? How often do you want God to hide mercy rather than reflect it, to hide grace rather than show it, to be quick towards wrath rather than slow, to be not as forgiving towards them as he is towards you? How often do you want God to reflect your image when it comes to dealing with everybody else but reflect his image when it comes to dealing with you? You see, the God that we want for ourselves is the God that is available to all people. The God of mercy, the God of love, the God of uh, grace, the God is slow to anger, the God that has steadfast love and faithfulness. That God is available to everyone, not just you. And this appears to be Jonah's dilemma. He knows God incredibly well, but here's another dilemma about Jonah in his prayer with God. He appears to know God incredibly well, but he doesn't seem to know himself that well. Because if he knew himself, as well as he seems to know God in this moment, the God he's asking for would not only have an issue with Nineveh, but the God he's asking for, he would know would have an issue with him. You see, a graceless, merciless, quick anger God would not tolerate Jonah's disobedience in chapter one. Would not even tolerate Jonah's lip right now in chapter four. A God who did not allow a chance for Nineveh to repent would certainly not grant Jonah a second chance to repent. 
You see, the level of vengeance, the level of gracelessness, the level of mercilessness, the length of the fuse that you have for others who aren't you and aren't a part of your group will ultimately always be consistent with the level of understanding you have about yourself. You understand that? The level of patience, the level of, or rather the level of vengeance, the level of gracelessness, the level of mercilessness, the length of the fuse that you have, the tolerance that you have for others will always be consistent with the level of understanding you have about your own sin. And when you think you're righteous, high and mighty, then you'll have less grace for others. You'll only ask for a merciless God when you've been blinded to the depths of mercy that you yourself have been plunged in. Jonah appears to not understand this in the moment. And thus, his anger is kindled not only against Nineveh, but against God. Because for Jonah, it seems as if God appears weak. That's Jonah's knowledge of God here in this moment. But here's Jonah's life. Verse 3. Therefore now... Oh, Lord, please take my life from me. What is better for me than to live? For it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah's anger is fueled by his knowledge, but it also has unrealistic thoughts about his life that his anger is fueling. Have you ever seen someone show so much unjustified and misplaced anger that they sabotage their own lives in the process? Have you seen that before? Jonah is willing to take his own life in foolish anger than to allow God's full and glorious nature to be on full display in the rescue of these people. Several years back, I was at a sporting event where a young man got incredibly angry with his teammates, his opponents, his ref the referees, the coaches, everyone in between. You know, whoever wanted something that night was going to get it from him. <laughs> All right? He was upset. His game was not going well, his team was losing, but it was in large part a performance of his own making. He wasn't focused, he wasn't sharp, his emotions were taking him out of the game, and eventually it cost him the game, and it cost his team the game. After the game, I was invited by the coaches, the coaching staff, to go and speak with the kid to try to calm him down, because his anger had boiled over in the locker room, and now he's cussing at his teammates, he's cussing at his coaches, um, cursing for the proper in the room, um, but he's cursing at everybody. And all of a sudden, he comes out, he, 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 he you know, just barges out of the locker room doors. And he's cursing and pointing at people. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care about any of this. And I started a conversation with the young man to try to calm him down. And if you've ever been a part of one of these moments, then you know that sometimes it seems the more you try to calm him down, the angrier and louder they get. And so he's throwing out more cuss words screaming and hollering, yelling at everybody around him. And as I'm reminding him of what's at stake, he's yelling louder about how he doesn't care about it. Hey, 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 son, listen, you got to calm down, man. They can kick you off this team. I don't care. Hey, listen, you need to calm down. You're probably not going to be able to play again if you keep this up. I don't care. Man, your chance at a scholarship, at a, at a free ride to college is on the line. You need to calm. I don't care. And finally, I said this, nah, you do care. That's why you're so angry. Your care and your anger is just misplaced. And at that moment, he immediately started crying. And I told him this, I said, hey, listen, son, anger is like gas. It's like fuel. You can use it in healthy ways that leads to passion. Just like fuel, you can pump gas in a car, you can drive all, all over the country. Just like fuel, you can power a house with it. But also, because it's a fuel, if it's unmanaged, it can burn the entire house down. It can destroy things that you love and that you cherish. And you're about to allow your anger to destroy the things that you love and the things that you cherish. Jonah's anger is so hot, so unjustified, so misplaced, that now the same life that he begged for when he was out in the sea, the same life that he celebrated over when he was in the belly of the fish, the same life that he said, thank you so much, Lord, for rescuing me and delivering me, 
is now the life that he's yelling to God to take from him. How many friendships, marriages, churches, opportunities, jobs, relationships with parents, relationships with friends and kids, how many of them have gone up in smoke because we allow unbridled and unjustified anger to destroy something that we actually cherish and hold dear, but don't have the ability to bridle our anger and don't have the, hu don't have the humility to back up once we've let it loose? God's response to Jonah, however, is very simple. Lord said, do you do well to be angry? I mean, do you really need to go there? Is this, is the anger you're reflecting, is it necessary? Is it really a good thing for you to be this angry about my, my actions in saving this city? Jonah's unspoken answer here is yes. And we know that because he later speaks. So Jonah's anger towards the people that God saves is unrighteous in the sense that it goes against God's character. It's arrogant in the sense that it tries to tell God his character towards Nineveh is not good. And it's reckless in the sense that he's willing to lose his own life and throw it away than allow God to be who God is. But you don't really see just how bad Jonah's posture is until you see him get upset again. And then you realize just how terrible this whole ordeal really is, which is the next reason that Jonah gets angry. Jonah gets angry because of the people that God keeps, but Jonah also gets angry because of the plant that God kills. In verse 5, he says, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself, and he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. <laughs> that is such an insane verse, by the way. It's a really insane verse. So, so Jonah has already gotten news from God that he's relenting. I'm not going to do it. They've repented. I mean, these people out here in sackcloth and ashes, they got, they got the cattle in sackcloth, right? I mean, everybody's in sackcloth. They're, they're fasting. They're praying. They're crying out boisterously to God. Please have mercy on us. And Jonah's like, all right, I'm going to go over here, and hopefully you're going to do what you need to do over here. And so Jonah leaves the city, sets up his tent, and he's hoping against hope that God is going to destroy them. You know your anger is bad when the hope that it is producing is in the exact opposite direction of God's character. We normally hope for God to fully display his character. Jonah's hoping that God will fully go against his character. So he's sitting back, relaxing, he's, he's built his tent, and now he's just hoping that God is going to do what he really wants him to do, which is wipe that city off the face of the earth. And so he, again, he goes out, makes a booth, which is a tent. He's hoping for a different kind of 4th of July fireworks show. And while this is happening, God decides to show Jonah and us, how ridiculous his anger is. In verse 6, it says, Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. So what appears as a gesture of kindness from God is actually God's grace on display being prepared to demonstrate some discipleship for Jonah. This is the discipleship moment for Jonah. He's going to teach Jonah a lesson. And God is using nature to teach Jonah this lesson. Notice something in the second half of the verse that we just read, verse 6 again. It says, so Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Sound familiar? It should. When you go back to verse 1, because when, in verse 1, when Jonah received the word that God was going to keep these people, and he was relenting from the calamity that was to befall Nineveh, a city over 120,000 people, 
The Bible says in verse 1 that Jonah was displeased exceedingly. He's exceedingly glad to have a day-old shade tree over his head to fix his discomfort. But he's exceedingly angry that God is saving 120,000 people and their cattle from utter destruction. Jonah's emotions are a window into his values. Do you understand that? The way he is responding to these different scenarios are glimpses into what he truly values. He values his comfort more than he values these lost people. And if it wasn't clear enough to you and how excited he was to have the plant, exceedingly glad that the plant was there, the day-old shade tree is now there, pay special attention to how he responds in the next few verses. Verse 7, it says, But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. Shade tree gone. Shade tree gone. Verse 8, when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the, head of the, on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. God said, do you do well to be angry for the planet? He said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. You know, I love how the Lord sets up Jonah's discipleship lesson. Remember early on what we said about this anger that Jonah has. Remember, we talked about the Hebrew word construction to describe that anger is actually a burning hot anger. We talked about his painting a picture that Jonah is burning with anger. He's July 2nd, Mississippi hot. So it is the Lord's way of almost poking and prodding here where he says, you're burning up, huh? Really hot, really angry. How about I show you burning up? How about I show you what it really looks like? And he literally turns the temperature up on Jonah, destroying the precious shade tree, and then sending a scorching wind to make it even hotter. You see, God, out of, out of his abundant mercy and grace, has a way of sovereignly teaching us all kinds of lessons with all kinds of things. Nature, weather, worms, plants, winds. Sometimes he takes some comforts from us to grab our attention. Sometimes he places us in the heat to recenter our focus. How has God turned up the heat around you lately? Maybe, 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 not all the time, but sometimes it's happening as an opportunity to train you, to disciple you, to humble you, so that you cherish his character and his ways over your own. For Jonah, this lesson is pretty clear, even though we're not sure if he gets it. Prize these people over your plan. Prize people over your comfort. Seems that Jonah misses the message in a pretty big way, and we again see misplaced, unrighteous anger. Get, we get in verse 8 and verse 9, and what do we read? He says, it's better for me to die than to live. And this time he responds to God when he says, I mean, is it really a good thing for you to be this angry? And John says, yes, it's a good thing. Absolutely. I should be angry because you took my plant. I'm about to faint out here. Jonah's going through the same lessons. Burning hot anger unrighteous, unmanaged, leading to saying crazy things like I should be dead. A man with an anger so misplaced that he's willing to throw his life away for it. But this time, he's not throwing his life away because God doesn't execute vengeance on the people that he dislikes. 
that he has that he has a rival against, but rather this time he's willing to throw his life away because of his discomfort. He says, if I can't have my comfort, then there's no need for me to live. You know, as I look at our social media scuffles and fights, I often see people fighting and clawing for rights, freedoms, comforts. I shudder to think how many relationships and friendships have gone up in smoke because we allow unbridled and unjustified anger to drive us to fight harder for our comfort in this life than for the people in our lives. Are you more committed to your way of life than you are people? Are you more committed to your convenience than you are people? Are you more committed to your comfort than you are people? You ready for a really scary test? Here we go. What occupies your time, your talent, your treasure, and your passion? More comfort for yourself or people being helped, served, saved? What occupies your time? What occupies your treasure? What occupies your talent? What occupies your passion? What occupies your prayer life? More comfort for yourself? More people being helped and people being served? What do you pray more for? What do you think about? What occupies your thought life? Stacking more comforts? Or the people in your life? You see, these are windows, just like for Jonah, his emotions were windows into his values. These are also windows into ours. What occupies my passion? What do I get really, really angry about? What do I get really, really passionate about? It's protecting my comforts or the people around me. What do I get excited about? What do I yearn for? What do I pray for? What do I, what do I exert my energy towards? What do I exert my time towards? What do I exert my talent towards? More comfort for me or the people around me? What does that window, what does that glimpse that I'm giving you right now, what does that say about you right now? Where is your heart? You know, we can laugh and joke about Jonah being angry that this shade tree is, shade tree is gone. <laughs> but what are, the, what are the shade trees in our lives? Maybe the shade tree in our life is the 401K. Maybe the shade tree in our life is the, the amenities, the cable news, the, 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 the lights, you know, the, the, the big houses. The, the, what, what are the shade trees in our life that, that if God were to take them, we would be so angry that we say, you might as well kill me now. You want me to drive in this car? Might as well be dead and drive in this one. What are the shade trees in your life? How does God respond to Jonah? Verse 10, the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Now, here's what's interesting about this story. We do not get an answer from Jonah. And some of us may ask and wonder why. Why do we not know whether Jonah responds to God in a healthy way, in a righteous way? Why do we leave this story open-ended? And many, many theologians surmise that the reason being is because the story is not nearly as much about Jonah as it is about you. And it is about me. And so Jonah is proxy to us. And what God is doing in this moment is he's not asking Jonah this question alone. 
He's asking us this question. You pity the plant for which you did not labor or did, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. You pity the car, which is here today, gone tomorrow. You pity the house, which is here today, gone tomorrow. You pity the comforts. You pity the cuisine. You pity all these things in your life that are here today and gone tomorrow. And yet, you don't have any pity for the people that don't know their right from their left. The people that are dying daily around us. And not only do you not have pity for them, but you're angry that I have pity for them. You're angry that I keep them around. You're angry that my grace showers them, that my mercy showers them, that my loving kindness is surrounding them. Should I not pity them? It's God's word to us. God is asking us in this last verse, to see Nineveh, our Nineveh, whatever that Nineveh looks like for us, our block, our neighborhood, our community, our city, he's asking us to see it the way he sees it. And how is that? The same way he sees us. A God, merciful, gracious, slow to wrath, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. To see the people around you, the same way he sees us. How does he see us? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall perish, I mean, whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sees us and the way God sees us is demonstrated in God sending his son. He loves us with an everlasting love, which is why he sent his own son down to us. And Jesus is the greater Jonah. He's the Jonah that when he received the instruction from the Father, he didn't run and get on a boat in Joppa and try to go 3,000 miles the other way. Instead, he came infinitely miles away from heaven and descended down into earth through the form of a virgin and through the womb of a virgin. He obeyed perfectly, lived his life in perfect obedience to God, the Father. When God gave him the instruction and when God said, hey, our plan is to redeem the world. Jesus didn't grow angry with his Father. Instead, he affirmed his Father in his plans of deliverance. Remember, he's on the cross, and while he's being mocked and scorned, he declares, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He affirms his Father's plans towards us. Instead of craving the comforts, like Jonah craves the comforts, he rejects them. The Bible says he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. This is how much, when you need to know how much does God love us, we see it in Jesus. How much does God see us? And when, when God sees Nineveh, how, do, how does God see Nineveh? Look at Jesus. How does God see Vicksburg? Look at Jesus. How does God see you? Look at Jesus. And then he says, instead of you going around hating everybody around you, look at them the way I look at you. We've received too much grace and too much mercy for us to look at the people around us with the kind of unmitigated anger that we oftentimes show. We must start remembering the grace that we have received in Christ in order that we might see the Nineveh around us with clear eyes. Do you understand that? 
we must understand the grace that we received in Christ in order for us to cherish the opportunities to reach the people around us over our own comforts if it comes to it. But the way that we see that is by seeing Jesus. The way that we see that is by looking at what God has done for you and God has done for me. And the more we fix our attention and our eyes on what God has done for us, the easier it becomes to extend mercy to others. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. God, we love you. We give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for your goodness, your mercy, and your kindness towards us. We ask, Lord, that you would help us. Help us to see our Nineveh the way you see it. As a people who don't know their right from their left, as many lives that you are patiently calling to repentance. And God, help us see ourselves as people that are just like those, the Ninevites, people that are in need of grace. Help us see ourselves so that we would see the world around us rightly. God, where there may be unrighteous anger festering in us, driving us to despise those that you love. God, I ask that you would give us a clear picture of your character and give us a clear picture of that character being first demonstrated in our lives so that we may respond by seeking to exemplify and demonstrate that character towards others. God, if there be anyone in this room or anyone that's watching online that does not know you, Lord, I pray that they would come into contact with the God that is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I pray, Lord God, that they would have an opportunity to see what you have done for them in Jesus Christ, saving us from the wrath to come, extending grace upon grace. God, we love you so much. And we give you all the thanks and praise and all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. First Corinthians chapter 11, if you have your Bibles. First Corinthians chapter 11. Looking at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. This is an opportunity for us to participate in a sacrament that proclaims the Lord's death. This is a visual gospel proclamation where we take of the cup. And as we take of the cup, we are reminded of the blood of Jesus that was spilled and ratifying the new covenant on our behalf. And when we eat the bread, we are reminded of his body that was hung on a cross for us. And so when you eat the bread, you drink the cup, be reminded of what Christ has done for us. Be reminded of what Christ has done for you. Be reminded of what he has made available to all who would profess him, confess their sins and, and confess him as Lord and Savior. Be reminded of these things. And be reminded of the oneness that you have now, that you have been engrafted into one body, that you are now sons and daughters of the living God as a result of what Christ has done. Be reminded, amen? Amen. Those who are, um, those who know Jesus are in fellowship with Christ, serving or that know him as Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity to participate. We ask that you would come, and as you come, we ask that you would hold, um, hold your cup until we um, finish our last song at, the, at which time we'll participate uh, in this sacrament together. Amen? Amen. Come now.
not be silent. And I will not be silent. I will always worship you. As long as I am breathing, I We are gathered here because of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, his life, perfect life, not only established our salvation, our eternity, but established our adoption into the family of God. All the good blessings that we have has come as a result of what Jesus has done for us. And so it is with that memory in mind that we partake in this sacrament. The bread represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was hung on a cross for the remission of your sins. Eat. The cup represents the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was spilled on Calvary's cross for the remission of your sins. Drink. Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples and he declared that all power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
and remembering, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Saints of God, may we go and do likewise, making disciples of all nations, telling the world of our beautiful Savior, and remembering that when we go, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, goes with us. God bless you. Love you guys. Y'all have a wonderful holiday week.